Can you do harm surgically? Oh yes, surgical errors do happen. What's happening in spine surgery nowadays? I'm assuming more robotics is being introduced. Robot helps us place our screws or implants more precisely. How? Sitting positions have an impact on the spine. Absolutely. Sitting is the new smoking. And this is something that came 10 years back. The more you sit, you're actually loading your lower back. Did you ever cry after surgery? Thank God that's done. I'm waiting to cry. The day I can shed tears, I would feel lighter. Do you enter flow state during surgery? When Virat or Tendulkar go into bat, they want to get that first run. They're not thinking of the century. That's exactly how we go in. Spine surgery is a combination of the efforts of orthopedic and neurosurgery. How many different kinds of spine surgeries are there? Let's talk about slip disc. Yeah, very common problem. What is a disc? A disc? This is a great point to bring in an exercise I'd planned, which is WWE. Type worst wrestling injuries. I can't believe we're doing this. Of course, this is going to be fun for biology enthusiasts, for medical students. But whenever I'm speaking to such an experienced surgeon, I speak about life as well because I truly feel like the process of surgery, when you do it for a living, it changes the way you look at the world. It changes the way you look at life in general. We spoke about everything from the kind of spine problems that you and me, everyday people would see to some of the most intense spine injuries, spine related trauma cases that Sir has ever seen. It's Dr. Ram Chadda on today's episode. This was one of the most intense medical conversations that we've had. So if you've seen any of our medical conversations on TRS, you're going to love this one. Everything from cricket injuries to posture to morbid details of surgery. All of this is coming your way on this new medical series of Beer Biceps. It's Dr. Ram Chadda on TRS. Thirty years of being a spinal surgeon. How are you, Dr. Ram Chadda? I'm good. When you do so many surgeries, what changes in a human's mind? What changes in you? I change from being informed to being knowledgeable to finally being wise. Uh, through surgeries? Yes. You think wisdom increases through surgeries? Yes, because we learn when not to operate. What does that mean? All my life, I've learned from my patients whom I see in my clinic and from other patients who come to me that the decision for surgery is far more important than the incision of surgery. The decision of surgery is more important. What does that mean? In life, like in surgery, we have a product, we have a process, and we have a purpose. Surgery is a product. In ki micro lumbar surgery ki hai. We have done a micro lumbar surgical decompression of the spine, lower back, for a nerve which was getting pinched. Hmm. That's the product. The process is the way it was done with the microscope, with a particular light in the operating room. The purpose was why it was done. When we begin our career, as I did 33 years back, I was very keen on executing the product. Mm. Over a period of time, I honed my skills and learned how to do it well, the process. It's much later in life that we as doctors and more so as surgeons realize that why the surgery was done was the most important. So the purpose is more important than the process, is far more important than the product. The why is more important than the how, 
and is far more important than the what. Mm. So as we age, as we ripen, as we grow older or senile, wisdom dawns, knowledge reduces. Knowledge is information coming here. Wisdom is pushing the irrelevant knowledge out and keeping just that which is important to be executed. Mm. So the past, the present and the future makes me less aggressive and has taught me that do no harm, which is the primary thing that a doctor or a surgeon should do, should be do no harm surgically or non-surgically. Hmm. Can you do harm surgically? Oh yes, we could. Surgical errors do happen either by oversight or by mistake. What is oversight? An act of omission or an act of commission. An act of omission is where a surgeon does not recognize something that was present during the operation. Hmm. Oversight. The eye does not see what the mind does not know. So hmm. a particular surgeon was not wise or knowledgeable enough to pick up something which he should have picked up. An act of omission. An act of commission is either by choice or by accident. Something which did not need to be touched got touched. Mm, got it. So these are small nuances which could happen in the life of a surgeon and could create a paradigm shift in the way the surgeon looks at himself and the way that you, that is society, looks at us. And in the way the patient lives the rest of their life. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, when I do podcasts with people from different industries, uh, there's always a commonality I see. For example, you'll see that all cricketers are the same way inside. All the actors are the same way. Uh, specifically with respect to sports. Are you a sports person? Like, Do you watch? Of course. Your, okay. So, when you talk to opening batsmen, it's a very common theme. Which is that they're a little crazy. Opening batsmen are a little whacked out. It's just how they are. Shikhar Dhawan. Uh, and all the other people I've spoken to. When you talk to goalkeepers in football, they're the same. A little whacked out. And I'm saying this as a compliment because I feel even I'm eccentric. But I feel the most experienced surgeons are a little bit eccentric. And it's nice. So I always question that when you're opening up a human body that much for a living, does it change something in you? Does it change something in your brain? Which makes you, it definitely makes you different from the doctors who don't go about surgery. I'm not going into a doctor classism angle. I'm just talking about personality here. But it changes you a little bit from the rest of society also. I don't know why. Maybe when you're opening up those bodies, there's some kind of energy exchange that happens between you and the patient. I don't know. I'm just firing darts in the dark. So you tell me, am I saying something? You are absolutely right. If you allow me to just trace the way I am, Sure. I have had the good fortune or ill fortune of having operated my own blood relatives. And that is what actually convinced me about what you're just saying. That surgeons who are actually karma yogis are performing surgery with detached involvement. We are associating ourselves as the instruments who are performing the act. Hmm. We need to detach ourselves. We must understand that the entire Bhagavad Gita is based on the despondency of Arjun who was unable to pick up the, uh, the bow and arrow against his own blood relatives. Am I correct? Got it. I connect, empathize, I'm compassionate with my patient. But during the process, the purpose is far more important. And hence, I disconnect myself, detach myself 
with that human being mm. who has given his or her life to me for those couple of hours mm. with the idea that i as an instrument of a much higher force and doing something within him or her to change the anatomy the structure so that his or her function or physiology improves mm. or or the reality improves just absolutely the quality of life improves mm. what i do is handle neck and low back issues because that's my core competence we need to do something which improves their quality of life god so we either tell them to modify their lifestyle to suit their back or modify their back to suit their lifestyle wow that's all that we do okay every single podcast uh, i do research but i also do a lot of visualization of how i want the conversation to be uh like i'm very passionate about this process especially for some reason with doctors maybe because i'm from a medical background as in i'm not from a medical background my family is like full of doctors so i've always been passionate about biology there's something that's always made me very fiery passionate about the body so i love that at this stage of my career i actually get to dive a little bit into biology for this conversation with you the moment i read spine surgeon on my schedule my first thought was electrician of the human body because technically as an engineer i have realized that the human body is the world's most complex machine and when you truly break down each system uh it is a smaller machine in some way for example your hands are levers uh the brain is a very very big combination of transistors and electric circuits and the spine is one of the most complex meshes of wiring uh i think that's a great place to begin because we had dr alok sharma on the show he's a neurosurgeon uh very very fascinating conversation about the brain i don't know if you've seen that episode you have okay. yes i have uh did you find any value in that I as did. a spine surgeon i did because very often the neuro spine surgeon and the ortho spine surgeon work as a team the neuro spine surgeon and the ortho spine surgeon so is he a neuro spine surgeon because he's a neurosurgeon who also does spine okay i'm an orthopedic surgeon who mainly does spine but how <sighs> one second your you you deal with the bones in I, the spine i am i'm an electrician with a carpenter's background okay so uh there is a set of bones the vertebrae in your back uh now the vertebrae are basically like kind of a wiring sheath and they cover the live wire inside which is your spinal cord the spinal cord is divided into discs uh and that's why when you say slip disc it's one of those discs that's slightly slipping out but effectively the the discs together are an inner sheath for a set of very very complex nerve systems that travel from the brain to the rest of your body and from the body to the rest of your brain so all the nerves in your hands and all over your body which govern everything that you do basically kind of first meet in the spine a processed and then sent to the brain fair enough absolutely is there anything you'd like to add no i just like to say that the simplistic way is it's a combination of bones and nerves mm the nerves are the soft elements the bones are the hard encasing sheets as you mentioned and to reach the soft elements which are vital we have to go through the encasing bony elements hence a spine surgeon is a combination of carpentry mm. and electrician mm. now if the intricate internal wiring or the micro circuit of that particular nerve needs to be opened and looked into then we should work together the neuro spine and the ortho spine together hmm so we work actually as a team okay uh 
now i want to use my platform to clear a very common indian misconception when people see veins they usually say wo dekho nerves dikh rahe hain which is such a wrong misconception these are not nerves these are blood vessels absolutely uh, nerves are extremely microscopic absolutely but which makes me question you because how are you able to operate on something that's microscopic yeah. you're right veins are like tubes so the people who look after the veins are more like plumbers we are carpenters and electricians how do we address these microsurgical aspects of the human body we use illumination that is better light damn we use magnification by wearing operating loops which are magnifying glasses or operating microscopes these are the levels that we have graduated through in the last few decades 30 years of spine surgeries so roughly 1993 you must have started well i started and qualified as an orthopedic surgeon in january of 1989 hmm i did orthopedics and spine surgery with my license till the year 1994 and 94 onwards i restricted myself to doing only spine okay so it's now the 30th year that i'm doing only spine okay the spine is that particular part of the human body physically and emotionally which keeps you erect emotionally yes in the sense that your spine is an integral part of your self esteem mm. if you were to stoop and look at yourself in the mirror each day in the morning you have a different vision of yourself vis-a-vis a person who is chest out chin up and looking at himself so for me it's a very very important part of the human being not just for physical health but for mental health mm agreed and having your neck in a proper position having your mid back and lower back flexible so that you can do all the activities that you need as a bipedal please understand unlike other animals which walk on all four we have to have a bipedal gait where our lower limbs and upper limbs have different sets of functions mm. and it's the spine which has to work against gravity unlike many other animals where they have gravity assisting them to a certain extent hence our discs or shock absorbers that you spoke of take more loads because we stand we move we bend we dance we lift weights and with each passing generation you are the next generation i am the previous generation the demands that you are putting on your back are much higher really like, absolutely for example weight training weight training uh, the number of hours that you put in a sitting position it's sitting positions have an impact on the spine absolutely sitting is the new smoking and this is something that came What? 10 years back What? okay the more you sit you're actually loading your lower back the more you stoop you're loading your neck but then how does one live if sitting is bad you need to keep walking around absolutely you need to get up take a short walk come back most people in the past and just compare your father your grandfather your great grandfather as many generations as you would remember your grandparents they spent more time outdoors they spent more time doing physical stuff we hardly do any physical stuff mm we may live next to a garden but we don't go for a walk mm we may live in a society which has a pool we swim once a month so there is something amiss somewhere you're a graduate of sain hospital yes i am okay uh the one thing that mumbai folks would know about sain is that it's geographically located in a very peculiar place so i'll i think you know exactly what i'm saying but i'll kind of give context to the listeners uh when you are returning from pune or the rest of maharashtra from the highway uh I, for a lot of people the city truly begins from sain you have to go through chembur etc chunabatti and you arrive at sain what i have been told by a lot of my medico friends is that 
this is the reason sign hospital receives a lot of road accident cases correct absolutely so doctors who are studying at sign hospital and doctors study for a very very long time and i think a big part of your studying is actually practical stuff like actually doing the surgeries i don't know how to sugarcoat my words but you'll see some pretty horrific accident cases i'm assuming as a spine surgeon accident cases are one of your mainstays in your profession correct yes and no no it was when i began my career 30 years back today i do see a lot of non trauma related spine issues as well just because of lifestyle exactly thank you so much so at that time there was less lifestyle related absolutely really damn okay okay you've opened up a whole portal for me to ask you questions about but can we go back to sign hospital time yes uh what's the worst accident case that you've seen which was surgically also the most challenging but also the most horrific well in sign hospital we addressed a lot of trauma and for me that one experience that comes to my mind is that i had recently qualified as an orthopedic surgeon and there was this house collapse that had happened in kalba devi like a building had a collapsed. building had collapsed and for some reason uh, sian was the go to trauma center despite nair and jj hospitals being closer somehow the call came to us and we were told that there's a man who's entrapped deep within the debris there gasping for breath and his limb is stuck there one limb one limb is stuck in the debris and the collapse is still continuing to happen what does that mean the building has collapsed but there are insecure elements which are still falling all right what do i recollect i recollect as the orthopedic trauma senior most person going with one junior and one anesthesiologist by an ambulance in a corridor which was created by the mumbai police to reach kalba devi and salvage this man at any cost that's all that i knew can you guess what i had to do you went inside the debris yes did you operate her? sir with due respects what we had to do there was actually disconnect this man a part of his limb which was entrapped there tie what we call a tourniquet on his thigh so that the bleeding doesn't continue and then transport him in 18 minutes in the middle of the night to sian hospital and start the surgical procedure of salvaging the rest of the human body but the surgery actually began at the accident absolutely site. so this was the most challenging thing that i have faced in my entire medical and orthopedic career where i was a part of the team the anesthesiologist gave him a mild sleeping medication for the period during which i tied this on his thigh disconnected him with the debris deep within risking the life of the lady anesthetist and my partner and myself got this gentleman out put him into our ambulance and through that same safe corridor which is now popularized for organ transfer which we didn't have at that time organ transplantation the police created a corridor by which from kalva devi to sian hospital we made it in 18 minutes this tourniquet which stops the bleeding can be kept for a mat maximum of about 1 hour what is a tourniquet a tourniquet is a tight rubber band which goes around the thigh and prevents the blood flow did you amputate yes sir i disconnected the life portion from the part that was entrapped i at oh. at the kalba devi place was he given anesthesia yes by by okay. anesthesiologist okay okay wow so it's it's something which happens to be probably the only type of surgery that i've done but is something that shook me up and something that for the first time convinced me 
that we as doctors can at the most be godly never god and that's where i am today why did it shake you up it brings you down to reality we claim that we can save anything we can do everything we can improve quality of life we probably can only do our best and there are some things which are beyond us which we need to accept both as patients and as doctors because your own life was also at risk absolutely very close i was willing to risk that i was happy doing that so while the building is kind of collapsing around you you have to also put in some hyper focus mode focus on that leg yeah so that you don't do anything wrong in the surgery which has already begun in the middle of a falling building yeah how do you divide your brain function into this part of it will be for self defense this part of it will be for my work are you thinking at all about self defense no so it's 100% of your brain is on work only on my work and the clock which is ticking why because of bleeding because of the fact that once i put the tourniquet there there's a timer there's a time damn if that happened in 2023 if the same thing happened in 2023 what's different i would hope there would never be such a house collapse but if there would be disaster planning is better uh, sort of prioritized today uh, they would be picked up quicker they would be transported to a nearer destination and both the life of the person doing the rescue and the one rescued would be at lesser risk mm. what happens after a surgery or after an incident like this it convinces you that you are human it convinces you that there is a larger belief system that you have to believe in it reduces your fear and increases your faith fear of what morbidity people fear only two things in this world they fear death and they fear the unknown for me i mean it's very common for people to say that in a in a difficult situation what do you do when you're in a fearful situation you are first freeze then you either fight or you flight correct but for me fear is only an acronym it's false evidence appearing real mm and you could either fight and face it or you could freeze flight and run away did you ever cry after a surgery ki thank god that's done i'm waiting to cry like it's there something is built up inside you i'm waiting to cry because i believe that the day i can shed tears i would feel lighter don't you think that's societal conditioning a little bit it is hmm it is do people ask you these questions usually at social functions no they don't because it's too morbid absolutely in the average person's eye absolutely do doctors ask you these questions no sir why because none of them think as deeply at least in society or in the open you mean in the hospital they go into a doctor mode probably okay may i interject here sure sir i ask these questions to myself very often hmm see i'll tell you my reason for asking you these questions It's because I'm really enjoying talking to the surgeons we're having on the show. I just think it's a very strange life when you truly look at the human element of it to cut up someone's body, alter it for a better future reality of that person. Like they say that uh, the earliest records of surgery are found in India uh, by Sushrut, I believe, yes. was the name of the historical figure. Yes, but my. reason for bringing up sushrut is not just national pride and celebrating indian culture it's to think of the reality before sushrut first did his surgical procedures at that time there was no such thing as surgery so sushrut as a young guy would look at another ill person and say hmm what if i cut up that person's body go inside change certain things patch it up and then see what happens like you need to be a little whacked out to like think like that absolutely which is what makes me think that extremely experienced surgeons like you and i'm saying this as a compliment so please don't mind the words 
but are a little backed out in the same way that i admire openers and goalkeepers in sports i admire surgeons like yourself that it's a little crazy even my job has made me a little crazy to get to talk to you today and they get to talk to a military vet tomorrow and then an opener and a goalkeeper day after so my personality has changed so much because of the show i always want to know about the personality changes that you guys face by cutting up human body seeing that much blood that much trauma for like a living so it's it's fun talking to you guys thank you can you see a person's life when you open up and see the spine i love the question i see the person's life in the multiple hours i've spent with the patient his family and his caregivers before i have decided to operate the patient but you can see the story in the spine the story in the spine is localized to what i believe i can correct under his supervision hmm. because i am not the doer i am just an instrument in his hands and i shall embark on that journey because that is my job or my karma you know one only truly understands death when they see the death of a loved one for the first time and after the death you see an emptiness in your own house or in wherever the loved one was present in your own life then you understand the power of death and you also understand the power of life now spine surgeries take a human soul very close to death i'm that's a fair thing to say absolutely my question to you is when you're operating on someone's spine do you think god is also present in the operation theater because it's such a heavy duty thing you're doing you are using god as a specific terminology i use god as a belief system which means i need to include the agnostics and the atheist as well sure so for me it's a belief system and that belief system is very much around and it is the interdependence of the human who is subjecting himself to a procedure on the person who is executing the procedure under the supervision of this belief system which makes a surgery reach its final destination do spine surgeries happen without your motor function truly being involved what i mean to say is when virat kohli hits a cover drive it's not technically him hitting the cover drive it's his years of practice the surgery work the same way you just open up a person's body and your hands know what to do or you have to truly put your consciousness there and is it like art they both the same thing secondly virat kohli's cover drive and art because they both happen in flow states do you enter flow state during surgery i love the question again first i'll take the art part and then i'll come to the competence part sure for me every surgeon is an artist and he has to be that way people who use only their hands are laborers people who use their hands and heads are craftsmen but people who use their hands heads and their heart are artists but how do you use your heart in surgery oh my god that's it for me surgery is not execution of the process for me surgery begins from the moment he gets into my my clinic to the time that he okay. smiles back and says doc i'm good so the heart actually is the most important Understood. because it's the heart that decides the why it's the head that decides the how and it's the hands which decide the what mm. so for me every surgeon has to be an artist where the heart has to rule over the head which has to rule over the hands now coming to that second part virat kohli today versus virat kohli 15 years back ranveer alabadia today compared to ranveer alabadia 10 years back ram chadda today compared to ram chadda 30 years back so we all go through the same ascending levels of competency at the first stage and this happens even after we've got our license to do surgery let's say 
we don't know that we don't know something okay then we reach a stage where we know that we don't know then we reach a stage that we know that we know and finally we reach this flow stage where even unknowingly we'll do the right thing hmm. it's the level of competency so you go from unconscious incompetence where you don't know that you don't know to a stage of conscious competence where your colleagues and your patients actually tell you that listen you don't know that's conscious incompetence you hone your skills you become consciously competent that's where most people actually end and stop they are consciously competent but it reminds me of people driving the car getting that driving license and within the first year have you seen them driving they're looking like this everything is disconnected they are not in flow the gear change is separate looking at the rear view is separate giving your indicator is separate that's conscious competence and then we reach that stage of unconscious competence we all go through this as human beings as professionals and most so as doctors and surgeons mm. we reach that stage of unconscious competence that unconscious competence has to reach a stage where it's not that you have to do it right but you have to do it so well that you can never ever do it wrong you yeah. there's a quote that says amateurs do it till they get it right professionals do it till they can't get it wrong that's it i think you're talking about one deeper layer than this also where sometimes you'll just see a very very new case even 30 years in and you'll know exactly what to do on a very biological level this is some sort of deep level of pattern recognition that's happening yes. in your own nervous system yes as the surgeon yes that even if it's something you've not seen before yes. your ai is able to predict the solution absolutely it's it's just like that coconut vendor from whom we buy our coconut water hmm. before he's chopped that coconut you tell him i want the one with the tender coconut and less water or you want the one with more water and less tender coconut 99 times out of 100 what he knocks off after that cursory knock on the coconut is the right one for you mm. Mm. no that's how it comes okay when you say that you're a spine surgeon okay versus i've gotten both my shoulders operated for rotator cuff injuries because of sports um i'd gone to a very specific kind of orthopedic doctor dr narvekar for both my shoulders because that's his specialty sports related shoulder injuries but there's probably i would assume four or five different shoulder kind of surgeries with the spine now there's different sections of it there's different kinds of movement planes of movement etc there's so many different problems because it's a combination of bones discs nerves and god knows what else yeah. uh how many different kinds of spine surgeries are there lovely as of today spine surgery is a combination of the efforts of orthopedic and neurosurgery as in any spine surgery will happen with both an orthopedic surgeon and a neurosurgeon together either they should be differentially trained or there should be one person who's trained in both ideally wow okay cross training is one way of looking at it having a partner who's equally good is another way of looking at it and for me the second choice is better i'll be very frank i always believe that spine surgery is like flying an aircraft we have a pilot and a co-pilot mm. am i clear very rarely will you have a large aircraft being flown by a single pilot the risk that they take is similar to the risk that we take they have a pilot and a co-pilot and there's an entity called par distance index which means that if ranveer and ram are pilot and co-pilot surgeon and co-surgeon if we have a low par distance index which means that if i am about to make an erroneous step ranveer will say ram hold on even if ranveer is 30 years younger than i am before i make the step 
rather than ranveer say ram sir do you really think this is necessary is there some other way of doing it so the pdi has to be shot it's like the opening pair in cricket yeah. coming back to what you say it has to be a team hence for me i believe that having sub speciality interest which was the primary question yes there could be people doing just minimally invasive spine there could be people doing just deformity of the spine there could be people doing just spinal tumors there could be somebody doing just cervical spine or the neck so there are various sub specialists but having a team with two people at least even more at times where the par distance index or the pdi is low gives maximum benefit to the patient there for me patient comes first so even if it entails getting two or three people opinion pre op and intra op during the surgery i would go for it mm. like how on the football field you share a collective consciousness with your absolutely. team you you share a collective consciousness in the field of the human body absolutely okay so say if you are doing a full open surgery we are cutting up the back fully yeah what does the spine look like well the spine is very very fascinating unlike long bones which are structurally easy to describe which are tubes which have you know ends the spine is an interesting contraption probably something that was made by the creator to be a conduit between the brain and the rest of the system so there is that spinal cord which is the deepest and there is a covering around it so there is a passenger which is the spinal cord and there is a passage around it which is like a fort or a fortress which protects that passenger and if there is an intruder like the disc or if the passage becomes narrower with age called lumbar canal stenosis the passenger gets unhappy which is the cord and the nerves and that's what gives the problems so the structure is a very fascinating structure which is bones pointing to the rear okay your spine looks like a namaste from the rear which is the spinous process which actually opens up within that is the spinal cord the passenger the tube that is running from head to the buttock and at each level as you said those various discs and bones called vertebrae the nerves come out the left and the right the left and the right so it's a very fascinating structure that's the biological part the mechanical part which keeps it erect and gives us the posture is the bone in front which is called the vertebral body as in the spine is like a wire and in front there is a steady bone but yes. the spine has vertebrae absolutely got it so it's like a it's a bunch of rings yes with one line like going through perfect okay perfect that's what it's like since we open it usually from the rear we go through this spinous process and access the nerve hmm okay next to the spinous process are the laminae or the bones which are like windows which can be opened through the two laminae there's an interlaminar space and from there we can see the nerves that's how we do minimally invasive surgery where we sacrifice less or least or no bone and reach the nerves mainly spine related surgeries are for the nervous system absolutely but every nervous system related surgery requires an orthopedic surgeon to probably be present or many many surgeries do. all bony aspects of the surgery need the orthopedic surgeon but if you're an orthopedic spine surgeon you would do that and as i would say in a team i would get my neurosurgeon if i'm doing something within the nerve what do you mean bony aspects you mean you have to cut the bone yes cut yeah. the bone shape the bone shave the bone shape the bone and shave the bone yeah shave i probably understand that okay maybe there's a growth or correct uh something why shape the bone at times you're born with deformities of the spine you're born 
or you may develop them as you grow oh okay. when you get a deformity to one side it is called scoliosis which is more common than people think it is more common than people think mm. and it can affect you cosmetically sometimes functionally and in a big way if it's in the growing spine because your self esteem depends on how you look that's how it is what's the youngest patient you operate well youngest patients are children who are born with birth defects in the spine uh where with my neurosurgical colleagues i have actually addressed certain birth defects of the spinal cord in the lower part of the spine that i've operated on to try and reduce the long term morbidity of these effects congenital or birth defects correct okay um so what's the youngest patient well within a few months of birth so an infant yes an infant within one year yep how is the spine of an infant different the spine of an infant is not just a smaller version uh, the bones are not as yet well formed the nerves are pretty well formed and uh, the bone quality is a little bit softer and they do need to be handled with utmost care okay uh i'm setting context here for my next few questions how do you actually shave a bone like what is the tool used the tool that is used to shave a bone is a a burr or a drill it's something that oscillates and moves at a high rpm rotations per minute and it sort of hits the surface of the bone and without injuring other elements close by which are vital like the nerves just removes the bone like what you use in a dentist clinic similar absolutely hmm which they use like clean your plaque not just cleaning even the ones that they use to do your uh, uh, sort of intra tooth work are the teeth kind of an extension of your skeletal system not really not really what's different well this is enamel this is slightly different uh, they they are different from the uh, the bone the bone is more of a vital structure the nerves within the teeth are very vital the bone itself is completely very vital hmm. okay um what else when it comes to like spinal surgery what other tools like you spoke about this one thing what oh, else yeah. is there the other tools we use basically we use uh, tools which can make holes within bone we can use tools which shave bones we at times now use tools that can hold bones and move them like wires or screws we also use tools which can replace remove disc material or as I, implants putting us a, a a spacer there disc material yeah you have a slip disc very often only 5 to 10% of the disc slips out so you just remove that 5 to 10% leaving 90 to 95% in there because it works as a shock absorber yeah l- let's talk about slip disc cut yeah very common problem yeah um what is a disc lovely a disc for people who are from the western part of india there is a fruit called a targola <laughs> it's got a tender coconut like outer surface and it's got fluid within it's like a lychee it's like a lychee correct so the lychee targola but why am i saying targola because it resembles a disc okay the dimensions of a targola are much akin to a disc and when you peel off that targola it actually looks and feels like the disc jelly absolutely and for those who have had this delicious fruit as you are peeling off that targola occasionally in the gentle process of te- peeling it off sometimes the surface breaks and fluid comes out that's exactly what the disc is like it has fluid within called the nucleus pulposus and it has that tender coconut consistency out which is firm called the annulus fibrosus so when you are subjecting that targola or the lychee to vertical loading the fluid within pushes its way outside the confines of the outer surface hmm and in the slip disc 
especially younger people like you, since the outer tissue has got elasticity, it doesn't allow the fluid to come out easily. So you don't get a slip disc as easily. As the outer surface gets weaker, that is the elasticity is lost and that structure becomes plastic. Now, what is the difference between these two words, elastic and plastic? Elastic, elastic is comes back to its original form. Lovely. That's it. It's based on the modulus of elasticity mm. where once the deforming force is removed, it can regain its shape and size. That is elastic. While plastic, even after you remove the deforming force, doesn't regain its shape and size. Mm. So when the disc, which is elastic, is subjected to load, it can not slip or may not slip. But if the disc becomes plastic, and at one point it may get more plastic, just like a punctured tire, one area is weak, <laughs> pops out from there. That's where that fluid, which is the nucleus, pops out. That's a slip disc. That's the slip disc. And that causes two effects. It physically hits the nerve, which is called mechanical pressure. As in the jelly. The, exactly. Okay. The jelly hits the nerve physically and it causes some chemical irritation around the nerve. Really? So both these things cause that radiating leg pain, initially back pain and then radiating leg pain or neck pain and arm pain. Chemical effect on the nerve. Absolutely. What does that mean? Well, the proteoglycan, which is the content of the fluid within or the nucleus, is an irritant to the nerve. So it not just physically hurts the nerve because it's occupying the territory belonging to the nerve. It's an unwelcome guest, but it's also causing chemical irritation to the nerve. Like what? Like burns it? Sort of burns it. True. So what effect does that have on your... It causes burning sensation down the leg, pain down the leg, altered sensation, tingling numbness. Because all, because all these things that you're saying are feelings processed by the brain. Absolutely. So actually it's happening in your back, Yeah. but your brain can't make sense of what's happening. So it Absolutely. shows you as, listen, something's happening in my Absolutely. leg. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like your brain and your spine are alive in themselves. They, they have are. their own consciousness. Brain is the last thing that dies. Today, what is the definition of death? Brain dead. You're mm. not declared dead unless you're brain dead. Biologically, what is death? Biologically, death for me is inability to perform your functions and as defined today is after your cardiovascular and respiratory, that means your lungs and heart stop functioning, the brain also stops functioning. What's the time difference? Like how much time does it take? There is a lag, but I would not necessarily know the specifics and give you an objective answer to that. But yes, mm, these two are still in that phase where they may be transitarily arrested, but can be revoked or called back while the brain gone. once gone is gone. I mean, you've probably read about the Wim Hof effect where this Iceman has controlled his blood pressure, controlled his uh, uh, pulse and um, you know, managed to keep himself uh, on the Arctic ring and on Kilimanjaro, not getting cold, being in an ice bucket for 122 minutes. So these are things which you can control. Yeah. Actually, I want to just go a little bit deeper into the Samadhi angle uh, because it's from the world of yoga and philosophy. Uh, you know what else is from the world of yoga and philosophy? The spine. It's actually a very, very, very important aspect of yoga. Uh, so I knew that with this conversation, we'll enter that domain at some point. But because we brought up Samadhi now, I want to actually pull it up on the screen. Okay, so yeah, it's there. Uh, Nirvi Tarka Samadhi, Sarvichara Samadhi. Those are the two that come up. Uh, this is according to Ashtanga. Just can you open Nirvi Tarka? It has different names. Okay, so Nirvitarka is the higher one in which a person loses his touch with the physical sense of space and time. Uh, can you just open that? Samadhi explained. One second. Samadhi is made up of two Sanskrit words, Samha and Dhi, which means equanimous and buddhi. Or, okay, which means equanimous and intellect. So basically a higher form of intelligence, a higher state of human consciousness. Um, 
First of all, what what's your opinion on this as a man of science? What do you think of these things? Because my reading is that while we are all students of science, science is a compass, but philosophy and ancient culture are the hints for furthering the direction of the compass. That's how I look at science. Love it, love going deeper into science, but it's not the be all and end all. And my point of saying that is we have a lot of I would like to call them yoga haters. Uh that's actually what it is in my eyes where they just discount yoga and ancient indian culture in a lot of ways because it's not scientifically proven yet but that doesn't mean 5 years later 10 years later also it won't be scientifically proven i feel like science has a lot of catching up to do with ancient cultures from all over the world not just in india even in shamanism from south america they talk about these concepts like meditation they have their own version of samadhi higher states etc what do you make of all this as a doctor i have a slightly deeper take to this you spoke about samadhi which is one end the other end is where we all begin my journey is looking at it little differently that you go from a state of being buddhu to a state of being buddha and the journey depends on how much buddhi you establish so buddhu is stupid buddha is completely evolved and buddhi is wisdom buddhu is zero buddha is infinite and what is infinite infinite is basically the zero with a twist <laughs> wow are you getting where i'm yeah. coming from now this is totally based on where i started and hence it's close to me that science is based on evidence it is based on doubt investigations it is based on tuition from without it is exoteric while what you are talking of which is the end point i don't call it a fixed end point i call it an impermanent end point if you may allow me to use that is based on esoteric intuition hmm so science looks for evidence and you find evidence with your eyes open while the final destination you achieve with your eyes shut which means that whether it is meditation to reach that final destination of nirvana moksha self realization whatever word is your impermanent end point that is based on what comes from within and not from without science is totally without Mm. it is based on 2 plus 2 making 4 which is not so with what we realize with our eyes shut mm. where 2 plus 2 can suddenly become sigma exactly and your mind can't comprehend why 2 plus 2 is not equaling 4 absolutely and just like you said that the spine is a very very important part and as we ascend up the spine from the tailbone or the coccyx to the sacrum to the lumbar spine to the thoracic spine to the cervical spine is similar to the five stages of matter which is from earth, earth to water to fire to air to ether which is also how the six chakras inside the human body are represented absolutely and the sushuma is the highest wow okay. i really didn't expect you to bring this up but you're a spine surgeon so i'm so blown away yet happy that you brought it up the spine in so many ways is the control of the whole body but from a yogic perspective is the highway to the infinite that's what they call the spine in yoga how do you look at this i agree with the terminology of being the highway the controller but it is not the 
end point or the infinite bliss or the highest center the highest center is beyond whether it's your limbic cortex as an animal or the neocortex as an evolved species what is neocortex well the limbic cortex is what all human beings have where they differentiate between uh, pain and pleasure while the neocortex is what differentiates between right and wrong these are parts of the human brain so the neocortex is these are not parts of the anatomic neural of the human brain but these are the ways that a human being is different from the other animals that's how we become a social animal mm. for animals is pain and pleasure mm. that's the limbic cortex they work by intuition mm. they think fast mm. we think fast and slow like daniel kahneman or any one of the other things that you may have read where strategic thinking is an afterthought mm. whether it's right or wrong so that neocortex is what makes us supposedly a step beyond the other animals so that's where we are evolved as homo sapiens mm. i mean australopithecus zizanthropus homo erectus now homo sapiens there will be something beyond us mm. that's for sure but we are a step beyond the animals and what we are trying to reach as you rightly said is that nirvikalpa it's that state of bliss uh people also say that sat chit anand i mean mm. that's the final point of bliss mm. beyond your existence and that can only be achieved where you look at emptiness and impermanence you're right that's how at times if you really look at it whether it is the bhagavad gita whether it is buddhism each one of them they ultimately end up in the same place mm. when i was a kid and i do believe that children have higher intuition than adults do you believe that yes i do okay. when i was a kid i remember looking at my parents hustling working and there was a part of me that always told myself that no there's got to be some kind of meaning and purpose beyond working for a living not to say that they didn't have work life balance all that was there i'm talking about something deeper for better explanation i used to think that maybe human beings are superpowers but they need to be tapped that was my thinking as a child as i grew older and i read autobiography of a yogi and all these books i realized i was right as a kid we do not utilize our entire brains and nervous systems to their maximum capability by just living the life that we're told is a good life which is go out in the world make money etc why do yogis even practice that much yoga what are these tibetan monks up to in the himalayas what are these shaolin masters up to sitting in china there's some kind of higher process for a human being there's some kind of higher state that a human mind and body can achieve through practice and discipline yoga answered that question for me i'm sure there are different pathways etc uh but i've always wondered biologically what's happening in the human mind especially because there's this um old school saying that we only utilize 10% of our human brain and that's actually a very controversial statement there's a lot of people who don't agree with that people of science who don't agree with it there's people who do so i don't know if that's something you've ever kind of toyed with through your own studying that how much of our brain and nervous system in general is actually put to use and for lack of a better way of framing this can we sort of become superhuman in some ways that's the question to you i love the question i strongly believe that we are under utilizing our potential i won't give it a value of 10% 5% or 70% but i also believe in that word of neuroplasticity or neuroelasticity where we would only use as much as we tap and we can actually stretch that out tremendously today we are very very primitive as we read out some time back we are just moving from that tamasic to rajasic to satvik as the first step into trying to get beyond what we know but there's so much more and it can be done even the way we are today the fact that we can 
do our job and which we as spine surgeons do is detaching ourselves doing our duty which is our kriya but at the same time detaching and doing some sort of karma so that we can go beyond that duality we just read about the duality the duality has to be gone beyond the discernment or judgmental attitude has to go and you should be there detached yet involved and working like astitta pragya something that is not connected for the the end result or the outcome so you're saying that karma yoga is also one of the pathways to evolve into a higher absolutely hmm. in today's world between karma yoga gyan yoga and bhakti yoga karma yoga is probably what the majority of the population in the world can practice yeah. and should practice yeah. um i'm not actually going to go deep into kundalini discussions with you i also believe that audiences kind of have a fair idea what kundalini is it's supposed to be basically a bag of energy which is coiled up in your lowest chakra and when you reach a state of samadhi which i think is sarvikalpa based on what we read i'm not too sure if it's nirvikalpa or sarvikalpa uh that energy is supposed to rise up within your spine yeah. connect with your third eye and that is what causes a state of bliss this is according to yoga but my question to you is as a spinal surgeon if you actually cut through a spine you're cutting through the bone you're cutting through the disc what's on the center of the disc is it like nerve uh fibers which are like a wire what is it anatomically anatomically the disc is only a shock absorber the spinal cord is the nerve okay and it's the spinal cord which is vital a spinal cord is just a it's the tube it's a bunch of it's nerves it's the passenger it's a bunch of nerves encompassed within a covering which is the covering of the spinal cord the outermost of which is called the dural sheath or the dura what about the innermost there is a pia mater and in between the two is an arachnoid these are anatomic things but the these are the three layers or the coverings while the innermost is nerve neural tissue right okay. far beyond any electric cable do you think the spine has something to do with self worth absolutely i do not uh, have anything which is incorrect in your assumption most neck and back pains and i'm using the word most are psychosomatic in nature where the psychological component or the functional component may be truly more than the true mechanical or structural component and every word of what you said is true whether it's your endorphin dopamine serotonin oxytocin whether it is the hormonal imbalance whether it's how you look at yourself in the mirror every day in your case you said how your mother looks at you she's the best mirror you can have okay we all need mirrors to realize our self worth and that's what actually gives us the reason to live the next day so when you were physically stooping you were not just physically stooping but you were physically and mentally, mentally. stooping and it's been the best thing i've done for both my physical looks as well as the way i feel about myself absolutely like uh i've always been confident and brave it's just reached another level like it almost feels intoxicating to the point where i would never ever bend my back again you know it takes two or three weeks of slight discomfort not pain just slight discomfort to hold your shoulders back and to keep your core tight but once you get into that habit and people start noticing and you start seeing that now your, even your workouts are more effective because you're working out in the way that the weights are meant to be lifted you see better results in every aspect of life it's i it's one of my regrets from my 20s that i didn't do this earlier in life you know fixing my posture biggest thing i've done to myself uh and i think a straight spine is kind of sexy also generally great <laughs> okay a uh, little bit of trauma talk again have you seen road accidents yes i have what's the worst spine injury you've seen because of a road accident the worst spine injury that i've seen because of a road accident 
as far as the long term repercussions is a a neck injury where the spinal cord gets injured the tube gets injured but the bones don't really get injured too bad it's like what is commonly called a whiplash injury like that yes where the person gets paralyzed but the surgeon unfortunately cannot do much that's why i call it the worst as a surgeon we can only alter the structure and hope that that structural alternation translates into functional recovery if there is nothing amiss structurally macroscopically a surgeon can do nothing hence the worst injuries are whiplash injuries of the neck okay for the sake of better understanding let's get into a little bit of physics and yeah. mechanics yeah this has happened because of a car crash we're talking yes no in a car crash what's actually happening to the spinal cord just explain it second by second lovely in the car crash there is a passenger which is the spinal cord and there is a bony passage around it which is made up of different structures encompassing this vital passenger in a car crash there is a sudden deceleration after an accelerated movement so the mobile bony beads which are encompassing or protecting the passenger or the spinal cord move ahead and then abruptly come to a stop so they hit the spinal cord because they are capable of movement within but the spinal cord is a single stationary object so they tear it they hit it so there is something called flexion and then there is something called extension of the neck and this happens because there are beads which can move which is the vertebrae and that movement hits that not so resilient structure within though vital and damages it permanently which is the worst case scenario it's like how concussions happen in the brain absolutely like for example in football sometimes players bang their head against each other and yes. there are concussions because the skull is hitting the brain absolutely actually the space between the brain and the bone of the head precisely uh, but if the bone touches the brain this problems absolutely concussions can lead to even death absolutely now this is a concussion of the spine yes called a whiplash injury yes and you can't do anything because currently stem cell research isn't is is still in its nascent phase we are very hopeful that some day we'll be able to do something realistically how far do you think i have hope and i have faith and i have belief that if the human species deserves it some day we'll get it okay uh this is a great point to bring in an exercise that planned for this particular podcast which is wwe related we actually had a wwe wrestler on the show recently and they've been making a lot of appearances on podcasts have you ever had a wwe watching phase yeah i watched a lot of podcasts about my childhood wrestling heroes which is undertaker chris jericho all these guys a very common issue that they face is spine related because technically this is how the undertaker explained it and please doctor correct me as a doctor now your discs are between vertebrae uh if you're constantly falling for a living which these guys do what happens is that the vertebrae are constantly squeezing those discs think of it like a jam sandwich like a jelly sandwich the bread is really hard and thick and the jam is jam eventually when you keep pressing those two breads the jam gets squeezed out and that causes nervous problems correct explanation absolutely okay uh now what happens to a lot of these guys is that they get major muscle atrophy for example actually atharv can you load up one more google this thing google uh scott steiner chest uh scott steiner chest 
okay this is his body before and he was known for his uh, physique okay but yeah look, look, look at the second photo second photo only that one look at that that's the body on the left and this is the body on the right where they developed this very weird kind of atrophy and these guys attributed to some cervical spine problem so pardon my language sir but what the f- is happening here <laughs> well i'll be very frank uh if he's sort of got true neurological cause for this muscular wasting i'm using words which means that those muscles have become weaker hmm. the left side of the page shows those turgid younger muscles while the right side shows an excavation within the lower chest either it's a direct physical injury where there is an extrinsic damage here or the specific nerves to that and if attributed to the neck it could be very much in the lower neck or the upper chest that certain nerves may get damaged which may secondarily cause this weakness but is it common no it's not very very common but as i said uh, medicine is an incomplete science it's an infinite science we still don't know where we are going so that jam sandwich example i gave is true is it applicable here it could be other than that what else could have happened a direct extrinsic damage to the local part to the chest to the local part itself could have damaged the nerves but as i said the nerves at a specific area could get weakened by either a physical damage or a intrinsic neural damage okay possible so a lot of wwe wrestlers yeah a lot of them have the same weird chest formation possible I don't know what that poor guy is going through psychologically because on the left, you know, you're built like that, yeah, and that has a positive psychological impact. Whatever, I'm not even talking about steroid use. But once you've seen your body like that, and then you see your chest turning into this, it's just crazy. Type one more. I'll show you like a younger guy. K O F I Kofi space Kingston chest. Same. See. What is happening here? Like, can you see that? It's he's a younger guy. Okay. Probably in his like mid or even early thirties at this point. Yeah. The fourth photo. Yeah. He's sort of thinned down completely. Lost all his muscle mass. Yeah. I again see, see same injury that hollow chest. Yeah, but that's where we are coming from. Um, you and I, without exercise, may look like this gentleman after he's supposedly unwell, but. a lot of it is developed by putting an effort and there comes a time when either the the effort reduces or there is a diseased ailment whatever it may be which may cause that sort of a picture but but is there a true cause which is necessarily in the neck may not be in the neck maybe a little bit down in the upper chest you know this chest bounce thing you can do like once i'm doing it right yeah now, yeah yeah like you can only do it after you actually work out a little bit correct so why was i not able to do this chest bouncy thing before working out because you did have control over those muscles but it didn't have that muscle mass for you to do it okay so anyone can do it but because i have added after muscle an effort, mass after an effort absolutely okay absolutely right. little weirder question right after doing a chest workout i can do it much more yeah because there's blood flow in that region no at that time your muscles are uh, very actively uh, in that phase where they are uh, contracting and responding to the stimulus that you're giving them fair to say that your nervous system in that part of your body is far more activated after a chest workout the muscle response to the nervous system is far more activated okay what you're seeing is the response hmm. um there's another wrestler called ddp DDP left WWE uh, and he started this thing called DDP Yoga, which is just for the recuperation of mostly wrestlers but also athletes in general. So uh, the Undertaker, you would have heard of the Undertaker. He starred in a movie with Akshay Kumar. Or anyway, that's a separate point. But lots of these guys went for DDP Yoga program, and they've reported that. uh i think the undertaker said this on a podcast with joe rogan he said that he had lost a lot of function in his leg or he would feel a pain in his leg and all towards the end of his career and doing the yoga with ddp actually helped uh reduce the pain and he said it reversed that jam sandwich problem 
can you actually reverse the jam sandwich problem well i don't think you can physiologically reverse the jam sandwich problem but you can make your body a little bit more comfortable to accept it and live with it so cutting back to what we said earlier about how a disc is anatomically built you said it's like a bag of jelly and when that bag tears with age or through trauma that jelly spreads into your uh the areas which contain your nerves and then it causes irritation so fair to say that whatever these guys are doing at ddp yoga it's making those nerves used to that fluid there not just that they're also probably building up the muscles around it which can sort of splint the bones and give you that feeling of comfort see if there are two structures which are pressing each other if there's something that can physically get them a little bit apart like you can do your your chest bounce you could not do it earlier today you have a better muscle mass and control so if the paraspinal muscles could do exactly what you are doing with your ah. chest you could probably get a little bit of distraction effort there by building up your core muscles of the back got it got it are you getting the yes. similarity that's yes. where we are the one thing you learn about yoga after beginning it is that it's a lot to do with core strength yes flexibility is a part of it but there's a lot of yogic asanas advanced ones which you can only do with a lot of core strength absolutely and core is not just your abs it's your whole back your obliques a bit of your legs yeah. etc so probably these guys are just building up their core strength from a more holistic perspective rather than absolutely. from a wrestling perspective absolutely okay so that's what's healing uh okay just uh, go on youtube type uh, <laughs> I can't believe we're doing this. Type worst wrestling injuries, and let's have a spinal surgeon review this. Pause. When you land, you saw how that guy landed on his knees. That was Kofi Kingston, by the way. Okay. When you're landing on your knees, of course it's going to have an impact on your spine. Right? It's the same jam sandwich problem. Even basketball players are not always landing on their knees, but they're doing those dunks. they're jumping so much when you're jumping that much does it have an impact on your spine as well all falls will impact the spine but the ones that are the worst for the wrestlers are the ones where either they are physically entrapped by the other wrestler and the neck is twisted or they fall on their neck and they suddenly either hyperflex okay. or hyper extend right In our country the two places where you get it one is these young wrestlers if you know there's a lot of this kesari india and you know all these championships akhade akhade hmm. so they do get it even youngsters get it and they get disabled for life really that's one place where they get it and the other place where the unprepared get it are when people jump into a swimming pool not realizing that it's a shallow pool so what happens they hit the base of the pool and their neck neck just twists and they get permanently disabled if you jump into a pool believing that it's a deep pool and it's actually 3 or 4 feet you will hit head down mm. hit your head there and your neck will turn you mean when someone's diving absolutely like when you dive, dive into a pool precisely because you're diving with all that force absolutely so like going in a cannon motion in water then twist your neck oh yes that's very common very common what do you think the mindset is before they dive not thinking too much unaware very happy that they are in a pool mm. you know the one thing that both yoga and martial arts did to me at different stages of my life is that it made me extremely aware of my balance which then made me aware of my environment i don't know if that makes sense but you're way more observational because both these are processes that slow you down people think that martial arts is offensive but martial arts is much more defensive so it makes you extremely aware of things uh and i've not had a weird injury like that but i've seen too many friends who've had injuries uh anyway let's uh, play it play it they both ended up outside of the ring where ridge tried to execute an overhead belly to belly suplex on biggie if you oh did you see that biggie landed yeah. look at that look at that head biggie had oh so that's called a hyperflexion that's how his neck turned god damn uh, what happens biologically it's that same thing that your spine hits absolutely the spinal cord absolutely like a concussion inside your spine absolutely i think this guy still wrestling biggie and look at the size of that guy he is at least 
150 kgs at least yeah uh definitely the his own body weight would also have played a negative role in that impact right it does can people <laughs> heal from that if they don't have a permanent damage on day 1 itself a lot of them recover but it all depends on the primary damage the moment of impact absolutely all right which is luck based absolutely wow okay next clip biggie took on rich holland Big five worse injuries in wwe number five oh, uncomfortable he just torn his quad on two occasions and both were in high profile matches the first so, game i think all these are muscle tears the game tore his quad in 2000 lot of muscle tears that happened in wwe during a multi team ladder match oh, yeah this is where a ladder hit that guy badly wrong and it resulted i know like i have seen too much wrestling in my life biggie, biggie this is the one we just saw smackdown in 2022 biggie took a overhead belly to belly suplex from ridge holland on the outside of the ring and what still right on his neck rendering a recovery process when you break your neck like this recovery depends on whether it's something which is going to recover physically with neurological recovery or not if they do recover they recover between a few months to maybe a year or two if they're not going to recover they probably never recover okay future number 2 stone cold Austin would land on his neck and this Oh god. Did you see that that's called a pile driver? Did you see that move? In 2003. Extremely dangerous, right? Mankind. One post. Because you're technically putting a person upside down and then they land on the top of their head. Now, the actual technique in wrestling, you know, because it is uh, a sport where you're protecting the guy you're fighting with. That's the actual core of that sport because it's it is scripted at the end of the day. Absolutely. But accidents can happen where you could be an experienced person and maybe that guy is sweating so he slips a little bit below and he actually lands on his head rather than creating the illusion of landing on your head yeah so if someone actually does a pile driver someone can die right true because i believe pile drivers have been banned in wrestling because of this okay some people got terrible injuries but what happens when someone is landing on the head because of a pile driver as a spine surgeon like you saw that movement yeah if you slip slightly as you said the neck will tend to go into flexion okay and snap rather than just this flexion and extension thing that we're talking about can your neck just get squeezed like this it can get squeezed it can even get twisted it can even mo- move to one side or the other same in the concussion of the absolutely. spinal cord absolutely one last morbid question before we get into the final segment of the podcast which is more lifestyle related the morbid question is when you hang someone a lot of people assume that they die because of suffocation but i think the truth is they die because the medulla oblongata breaks is that correct yeah the medulla oblongata is closely associated with the ability to breathe as well so both these things happen simultaneously where your neck actually snaps the medulla oblongata is the highest part beyond the spinal cord up there where the respiratory center is also involved that's why i said that cervical spine C3 C4 C5 that is cervical 3 4 5 keep the diaphragm alive the diaphragm is our muscle here so when C3 C4 C5 or any injury above that happens your breathing center gets affected any injury above that means C1 C2 where, occiput C1 Where right is, at the right at the nape of the neck right at the top uh, where the skull becomes the neck ah okay right there okay when that snaps your respiratory centers ability to breathe gets challenged you're right but that snap causes all these things physical damage to the spinal cord itself as well as your breathing centers you're right the person who gets hanged what are they going through because i would also assume that they die in one shot i believe they do there's no way to know that of Absolutely. course have you ever seen videos of someone getting hanged no fortunately not no neither have i but i've seen movies in which they show it and they usually show the legs like quivering yeah yeah why would the legs quiver well i can't give you a, a rational answer to it but yes uh, there is something called as a response of the part beyond the area of damage where 
messages from below are coming to the point of damage and going back rather than reaching the brain. There is a reflex by which that area quivers and then dies. If you were to imagine even experiments that were done in colleges or schools where uh, we had dissection of uh, certain cockroaches or dissection of earthworms or lizards and if you cut off a particular part, that part beyond it would quiver for a moment and then die. Because the messages which are coming, rather than reach the head office, return from that point itself. Electricity bounces Absolutely. back. Absolutely. Because actually messages are electricity. Absolutely. You've operated up there? C1. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. You feel more nervous when you're operating up there? No, I don't feel nervous, but I'll be very frank. I always enter a surgery feeling vulnerable. I always enter my surgery uh, having fear of the unknown to a certain extent. And I strongly believe that my performance depends on my being vulnerable rather than being overconfident. And that's, that's where I feel that we surgeons are also like the sportsmen. Yeah. I was about to when say. Virat or Tendulkar go into bat, they want to get that first run. They're not thinking of the century. That's exactly how we go in. We go in believing that we are trying to do good to this human being who has put their life in our hands. Hence, we are responsible for them, but we are still vulnerable. And that vulnerability is actually our strength. It's also student mentality for life. Yeah. The best professionals have that. We are. We and are seekers. We are learners. Absolutely. What's happening in spine surgery nowadays, I'm assuming it's becoming more and more non-invasive as far as possible. Yes, it is. And more robotics is being introduced. Yes, we are having navigation, image guided, minimally invasive and AI driven robotics. Correct. AI driven robotics. Yes. So an automatic surgeon. Not really. In spine, unlike in surgery done on the abdomen and the chest, the robot only helps us place our screws or implants more precisely. How? We preoperatively plan on a CT scan or intraoperatively with the imaging and we plan it like a Google map. One, just, I'm sorry, I'm making you go slow. Um, a CT scan would almost give you a 3D printout of yeah. the spine. Absolutely. So you're able to feed that into the machine and say exactly on this point we want. Precisely. Okay. That's what we do. When I'm doing it freehand, that is the way I was always doing it. I would put in a 6 millimeter screw in bone, which is 10 millimeters. Because I would need that 2 millimeter on either side as a safety zone or a safe zone lest I go out and cause damage. When I pre-plan it using robotics, I can actually put a 6 millimeter screw in a passage which is 6.5 millimeters. So it's a combination of 3D scans as well as the robot helping you. Absolutely. Okay, but... Practically, when you are opening up a human, what is the robotics angle present? Is it a tool you use? Yeah. So in spine, it's basically a hand. Huh? It's a hand which is going to come based on the way I have planned it before the operation. And it's going to come precisely and place itself, allowing me a passage within which I shall put my drill first and then put my screw. Okay. So let's say there is a tube of 8 millimeters in which I want to put a screw of 7 millimeters. I'll see that 8 millimeter tube on a CT scan before the operation. I shall pre-plan the size, shape, depth of my screw, length of my screw, pre-operatively, before the operation. During surgery, after my position 
has been attained my patient is under anesthesia the machine will then bring a small tube which is slightly larger than my screw and place it precisely dock it at a point where i go in physically and put the screw okay a bit of an engineering question how big is the machine and how do you know where to place it correct because all that will obviously determine then the precision angles yeah. the machine today which is the second or third version of the robot is something that stands beside us wow in a small position and is connected to the patient either physically or virtually based on certain fixed areas of the bone that it scans and it has a sort of a hand which moves and comes and docks at that bone so i need to actually match what i'm seeing with what i have planned before the operation once there is a match and it's green to green like you can look at a red yellow and a green situation green to green then we go in damn that's how it works it's like top gun where they try Absolutely. locking the aim on the your generation is going to be much better than ours at surgery at using these tools how long back did all this robotics and ai get introduced in your world well robotic spine is something that came into india about 8 to 10 years back how expensive is one machine <sighs> it's very expensive how expensive <laughs> well it's right now something where uh, it probably grows into anywhere between 10 to 15 lakh indian rupees to just get things in but the whole process is 75 80 lakhs and there are disposables of a lakh of rupees that could be used so it's a huge amount of money that's whole going whole process in. you mean to import import and get it installed and it's it's an expensive proposition it's a large capital expenditure for the hospitals that invest in it almost a crore roughly well it could go go to a, a large amount of money and how much does one spine surgery usually cost well a spine surgery where no metal is being used could be done anywhere in a public hospital for almost free where uh, the government is subsidizing it to a, a paying hospital depending on the paying capacity of the person so we have actually various options to do it but it's something which is totally based on the affordability of the patient rather than saying that this surgery costs this much uh, it all depends on whether you are traveling uh, economy class business class or first class what's the difference if you're getting first class treatment well first class treatment would be twice business class business class would be four times economy class but in terms of the user experience of the patient user experience of the patient totally depends on the pilot the doctor absolutely so and i would also assume as a non medico i would want it to be as pain free as possible and as smooth as possible and as effective as possible it would be as pain free as effective but it all depends on the empathy and the compassion of the pilot okay so you are effectively paying for the doctor yes okay um so assuming that i want first class treatment for something in my spine and i'm sure there's a bunch of different spine surgeries but the most common one which is what a slip disc surgery okay would cost how much a slip disc surgery where we are not putting in metal because most slip disc surgeries don't need metal well it could uh, go from anything in a in a sort of a less expensive place uh for about anything for 40 to 50000 rupees at the bare minimum to about 2 to 2 and a half lakhs as far as standard level of care yes if you want somebody to get it in a in a in first class or in you know an executive suite or a deluxe class then you would slightly add on for the perks but you could get anything done between let's say 2 lakhs to 5 lakhs that sort of a thing with being in a in a business class scenario yeah have, have you operated on a cricketer yes i have you can't reveal obviously absolutely yeah um but was it a bowler wicket keeper wicket keeper because and i'm just trying to understand sports injuries here was it a slip disc situation yes 
because of bending that much possibly was there a particular reason the slip disc had happened maybe one or multiple repeated accidents oh so it wasn't because of the sport it was because of the sport i'm calling that sporting injury as an accident trauma yeah, absolutely okay the one thing i know about cricket especially is that it's a very injury giving sport yeah like they say that with bowling it's not at all how you should treat the human body yeah bowling the way it's designed it's very unfriendly towards the human body which is why you see so many injuries with bowlers yeah um and the same with wicket keepers i think ab de villiers said that he really regrets taking up wicket keeping because it shortened his career yeah what happens to the spine in wicket keeping because i think he spoke about knees and spine it puts a lot of load on your knees obviously yes but spine ke liye what happens i'll tell you i have operated on wicket keepers because i said wicket keeper first because among wicket keepers bowlers and batsmen i've operated on more wicket keepers oh really okay and why do i say although there's only one wicket keeper out of 11 he's the guy who actually with every ball bends down and gets up bends down and gets up and he suddenly responds much quicker than anybody else absolutely sudden jerks on the spine absolutely which over the course of a day a wicket cause... a wicket keeper actually strains his back more than anybody else damn yes a pace bowler also does that because he pivots himself on one limb and throws the ball with high speed but all of them have sporting injuries but the repetition of the injury is maximum with the keeper because in a limited over match a bowler may bowl four overs somebody may bowl 10 overs but a keeper is going to be there through through and it's more like an endurance injury with wicket keepers like Absolutely. they probably hurt them when they go home yes it makes you think about the greatness of dhoni once again absolutely that how has that guy been so physically fit for so long absolutely there has to be some genetic angle at play he is a of course i'm sure his training is great his mind space is great mental game must be fantastic there has to be some genetic element because even the mental game comes out of genetics in so many ways yes Okay. Do you ever think of this as a doctor who's operated on cricketers? You look at certain cricketers, you're like, that guy is just special. I agree with you that all these sportsmen have something where they are beyond the ordinary. Yes, they are extraordinary, so they have something extra. Yeah. Um, can we actually pull up some more videos? Sure. Because we're doing this cricket special yeah. now. Type Hardik Pandya bowling injury. I think in the middle of one of the matches, he got some back situations. So I would love for you to actually break that down. Yeah, see that normal bowling, nothing, and then randomly starts this. Yeah. So in What's that it? case, either one of these two things has happened. That he's either snapped the bone or a stress fracture, or he's got a disc which is herniated. Why did he fall to the floor? Well, he fell to the floor if the nerve was got got impacted and he got weak, or he had too much of pain and he couldn't take the pain. and why is he on a stretcher now like well that is being protective we really don't know whether he's unable to walk or he's not being allowed to walk even this wheelchair situation yeah it's always better to be safe than sorry so what is the recovery yeah if there is a reversible injury then it recovers within a few weeks to a few months and if it's irreversible it doesn't recover the fact that he's recovered it was a reversible injury hmm and then there's your physio absolutely and all that absolutely okay um now we can come down to a much more everyday level instead of talking about sportsmen and wwe stars you said that in the 30 years of your profession only early on did you see many trauma injuries and now there's way more lifestyle related injuries when it comes to the spine these are normal everyday people office goers I am making the assumption that a lot of your patients are slightly overweight and the weight has something to do with the spine. Correct? Yes, you're right. I can't believe I'm asking you this and I'm not asking you this in a sleazy way. But if one has big breasts, that affects sp- the spine. Yes and no. I mean, if you're humongously overweight or oversized, it may cause a load because those women may tend to stoop forward but otherwise not really not a very common not thing. really okay but a bad posture where you anyway like this yes it your would spine is perpetually curved yes so those discs have a larger room to squeeze out of absolutely okay usually with overweight people the posture is also a little wrecked 
because of their weight yes i'm also assuming that many of your patients are in their middle age like 40s yes where the spine is kind of weak those discs are more plastic than elastic correct and the posture is wrecked correct then what i'm asking from very everyday city perspective what's one of the most common things you see the commonest thing that we see today regarding neck and back pain one is lifestyle where you're trying to aspire more than you've achieved and hence you're challenging your neck and your lower back physically much more like sports sports putting in more hours of work sitting for longer durations and working not exposing yourself to sunlight not having a good diet all these put together besides indulging in smoking and substance abuse that affects your spine it does right. it weakens the quality of your bone okay it it affects the entire skeleton the spine being affected probably the most yeah you know, one thing i dislike about the internet is that they over study a good lifestyle when actually a good lifestyle boils down to a few basics which all of us know but very few of us are willing to adopt in our life agreed which is just stay disciplined don't eat too much junk food absolutely That's life it. in moderation is a good lifestyle hmm. i actually thought i'll go over a whole lifestyle 101 with you but we've done that on all the medical podcasts we did it with the gut doctor we did it with the skin doctor the spine doctors also saying the same thing ki smoking chodo and like leave junk food it's the same basics in moderation okay everything done in moderation is acceptable okay so maybe a final kind of bottom line for this whole lifestyle related to spine is stay in shape stay fit would you say yeah because i mean please correct me if i'm wrong i don't know what you think of weight training what do you think of weight training what i think of weight training is that indulge in higher repetitions with lower weights rather than higher weights with fewer repetitions i repeat yeah. what i've said yeah get into doing them but more frequently but with lesser weights rather than trying to achieve much more yeah uh i actually had a powerlifting phase when i was 22 23 i'd gone up to a 200 kilo deadlift because i wanted to fill the voids i was feeling in life <laughs> that's the truth and it wrecked my body in the long term it's something i regret when you're surrounded by powerlifting bros they are encouraging you to lift you're getting really strong the strength is actually adding a lot of musculature also so you're very caught up in the nasha of looking the way you do and feeling the way you are but I regretted now at the age of thirty when I see what it left me with. Like I still have elbow problems. Of course, I was at fault. My form was not as good as it could have been. Uh, I got too caught up in lifting that heavy. Do you see a lot of deadlift related injuries? Yes, I do. Pe see people who have similar role models or mentors like you, and peers who push them too hard. Yeah. Who do come with similar injuries, and they just need a little bit of talking to. and at the end of it it's not just my talking or counseling that helps but they realize when they look at themselves that they've gone through something like you have realized yeah um okay i'll i'll give a very detached input on this okay do you know who ronnie coleman is no he's the most legendary bodybuilder of all time and we okay. had him on the show and he gave us one of our most epic episodes of the year so we'll pull up ronnie coleman on the screen as well um beautiful human being genuinely very happy because he won the mr olympia eight times no one's won it eight times other than him um and i asked him these questions because as of now he is your age roughly uh and he's on a wheelchair um we were actually concerned about how we could bring him into the studio he had to leave his wheelchair at the edge and he walked from that door till where you're sitting um and his back was fully bent he's gotten screws put in his uh spine uh so this is ronny coleman right now i mean this is not ronny coleman right this is him when he was competing and this is him right now and see i believe in subjective realities he himself is genuinely very happy now because he's happy with what he's achieved in life with you know he's genuinely a legend of he is the virat kohli or sachin tendulkar of bodybuilding So he's very accomplished, and even in his heart, he's very accomplished. But it broke my heart to see this legend kind of not even being able to walk. I have Ronnie Coleman, twenty twenty three. I will also definitely say he was one of the happiest people I've seen on the show, which taught me a lot about life. 
so yeah, he's on a wheelchair right now um that broke my heart and that's a very extreme but apt example of what weight training can do for the human body in the long term so on one end you see the most positive case of weight training again i'm not even talking about steroids here i'm just talking about human potential in some ways on the left and the outcomes of trying to achieve unachievable human potential on the right it happened because of too much trauma on the body as a spine surgeon and he's had too many spine injuries ronnie coleman you can actually pull up a youtube video of ronnie coleman as a spine surgeon sir what has gone wrong in ronnie coleman's spine i'll give you a little context bodybuilders all have their own systems usually many of them follow this uh, high reps or hypertrophy angle ronnie coleman says that his edge throughout his career and he also said that the modern day bodybuilders are not following that he said that his edge and he was supposed to be the biggest of all time also his edge was heavy lifting that he lifted very heavy and high reps the argument could be made that then that's what happens to your body biologically i'm asking you what happened from a medical perspective why did he land up on a wheelchair why is his back fully bent like this now well repetitive injuries to the back either related to a major trauma or repetitive micro trauma in his case uh, due to high intensity training could cause uh, the discs to get degenerated could cause the spine to get a little bit curved could cause the nerves to get pinched all of the above put together which could have caused this all right doc i think that's about it for today's episode thank you so much <laughs> i hope we covered a lot of ground um this is a very interesting kind of morbid but mostly interesting conversation i loved it thank you for having me here no thank you for being here sir uh i will link all your handles down below and uh, when it comes to spinal health is there one last sentence you'd like to leave the viewers with or just general health if not spinal health well the only thing i can say is that uh we need to take care of ourselves live in moderation and believe that uh we are responsible for our own health the the way we take care of our cars and our clothes we need to take care of the human body because it's basically just a vehicle which has been given to us and we need to take care of it gotcha jok to chala thank you so it's a lot of fun thank you so much god bless you thank you so thank you that was the episode ladies and gentlemen i wish to know what you guys think of this medical series of course it's easy for me to do the skin and hair and lifestyle episodes but i truly wish to know what you think of surgeons on the show because i genuinely love speaking to them and i love these kind of episodes so much that it's for the first time in a very long time not so much about the views i'm having these conversations for the sake of fun i really enjoy biology i enjoy kind of morbid conversations because they really test the way you look at life so please give me your feedback on this one tell me who else you'd like to see on the show tell me what other kind of surgeons you'd like to see on the show and do keep up with our hindi podcast as well if you understand and speak hindi we've got some fantastic medical conversations that we've done on that podcast as well trs will be back very very soon ladies and gentlemen and we will be back lots of love thank you for supporting boom shakalaka trs in the house now and forever